Um, so some people know who know me that um, I was ordained as a Presbyterian minister a long time ago, very long time ago. Um, hi, Carla. <laughs> nice to see your face. Um, but but before that and after that, I've done many things in the in many studied many modalities in the realm of spirituality. Um, just because it makes sense to me, just because um, it moved me along in life and it feels like the right thing for me to be doing. Um, so I've studied in, on the graduate level, uh, world religions, I've studied um, psychology and religion. I've, I've been practicing things for a long, long time. And I just feel real comfortable talking to people about this and helping them to move along if, as they choose to. So, um, and I come from a real, like, bad background. It was a really hard childhood, uh, an abusive childhood, just so you know, because people see me and they think, oh, it must have been, she must have been, you know, privileged or blessed. And, um, and I was not as a child, not in the way I would have wanted to be blessed anyway. And so, um, but there was always this inner guidance that, that sort of pulled me along and that I gave, I, I finally um, was able to give um, voice to and was able to help people to, um, to notice in their lives too. Well, awesome. So uh, since we have the word uh, spiritual in the title, mm -hmm. uh, can we define what is spirituality? And also, this is very interactive. So uh, I know you wanted the audience to kind of give their experience, but what is spirituality uh, for you or, or for everyone or you know, is there like some neutral way to define spirituality that everyone can agree on? Oh, thank you. There are a lot of definitions, as you, you guys probably know, um, but it always has to do with that inner self, that um, that more. I like to call it more with a capital M. Um, I don't particularly love to um, uh, relate to the word God, only because I tell my students that when we relate to the word God, we think we know what we're talking about. There's an assumption that we know, and we don't know. It's 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 a it's a big um, oh here I am admitting someone. This is this great, uh, and um, and so it's always the more the more than the brain activity, the more than the physical manifestation, the underlying principle of life, I guess one could say. And coming in contact with that, doing practices that help you to come into contact with that, just expand life and, and make it I don't know, more productive, more sometimes more happy. Hi, Louise. <laughs> I'm surprised by who's here. Okay, this is lovely. And I, I know and people I don't know, I love you too. Um, but I'm just surprised that I know some people here. That's great. Um, so if that helps, the other part of the um of the of the, the title is grown-ups. And um that's important too, because uh and I say, you know, a 45-year-old person is a grown-up, but not a grown-up as most of us here are grown-ups. We're really grown up. You know, we've got a certain amount of life experience and, and spirituality even changes from 40 years old, you know, right on through 50, 60, 70, 80. Um, it, it becomes more necessary and more real, I think, um, as we age. So, um, so it's finding that more. And um, I always mention to my students or counselees that it's about filling yourself out as you go along. You know, you, it, 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 Carl Jung used to say, you know, up to a certain age, you're busy building the life. And then at a certain point, you really get to be a wise person if you choose to be, because you're no longer occupied by the building only. You don't have to make a family or make a house or make a career. Um, you just You just live. And you can become a sage at that point and not probably not before that. Yeah, and then I think a little bit in the blurb that we had, there was something with, you know, like people uh, either really uh, enjoy observing their religion and others really get turned off 
by their own religion and it changes their whole path, their whole trajectory uh, between uh, spirituality and religion. What is the difference between spirituality and religion? I guess that would be the first question. And what about it makes them so divergent? Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of consider spirituality to be what the founders of each faith experienced and wanted to pass on. They did not, in most cases, want to become what they became through the religion. The religion is the sort of the codifying of it, the, um, the making it main, more mainstream, um, the uh, writing it down and the scriptures. You know, the, most people, um, most of the scriptures were oral and then they became written down along the way. And somebody needed to do that. <laughs> and it is good that they did that. But then it gets stuck. It becomes institutionalized in many cases. And so people struggle to find their true spirituality in that religious framework. That makes sense? It's not that it's bad. For instance, in the Christian tradition, you know, Paul came along long after Jesus had died and he became the one who set up the communities and wrote down the stuff and, and, and made rules. And that was all fine because probably we wouldn't have had Christianity, the message without that. But it did tend to get pretty stuck in places, as some of you might re realize. And, and so people struggle to, um, to live in the religion they were raised in or they chose and still have that spiritual core. Yeah, well, interestingly, we're in uh, PSS is uh, uh, headquartered in New York City, where you know, a wide range of religions, spiritual people and atheists, non-believers uh, are all coming together. It's almost like the uh, a, a, a melting pot or a boiling pot of I ideas, so to speak. Did living in this uh, part of the country affect how you developed uh, spiritually? Did it? I mean, probably, probably I was, here's, here's my history too. I was raised Roman Catholic um, uh, at a, and I taught in Roman Catholic schools for a while, got my graduate degrees, um, then got ordained late, later. I mean, it was, I was 30-ish or something by the time I got ordained as a Presbyterian minister because I kind of found a community that felt right. I made a friend in a minister who um, had a community I liked. And so I got ordained that way and, and managed somehow to, um, to stay orthodox enough <laughs> that I, I would say it was sometimes it was very, very, um, you know, getting, um, getting, uh, 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 what do you want to say hung or, or, or burned at the stake was a very real option, but it, it never came to that. And I got honorably retired a couple of years ago. Um, and so, but in that time before that, and after that, I studied the world religions and then began to like practice them sort of on the side, you know, like they were always part of my life, which is very odd for most mainstream ministers or priests. And so it became sort of part of who I was to have all these. Then I went and, and for a while I davened with a, a reconstructionist Jewish um, uh, group um, at their shuls. So I tried to, I haven't even had to try. It just kind of became part of me to, to be, be belong to all these different. So I guess living in this part of the country, we do have that opportunity if we choose to. I, Buddhist meditation is nothing different or odd, you know, um, a Sufi stuff, which is the sort of the, um, I don't say liberal or mystical part of Islam. That's very readily available if you want that. So, but I always, here's, here's something I do say to my people. And that is you probably have more in common with the mystics of another tradition than you do with the fundamentalists of your own. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, so 
Is there any question uh, that anyone here has or any question that you, uh, Marie, would like people to ponder about now because we're we're interactive? No, I just I want you to feel free to um, comment or or ask a question um, because I, I react well with that. I like to have, I feed off what people need or um, uh, have to offer. So please feel free if you'd like to. Here's someone else coming in. I'm, I'm getting all the admits, uh, uh, Jeff. Oh, me too, so yes. Well, Your co -host. I'm using, I'll, I'll handle it. And um, yeah, so and if, if anyone's shy about you know speaking or their voice, you can always uh, type in the chat and yeah. uh, and we'll see it. Now, please, please feel so, free to do that because yeah. um, cause some of you, I, I, I'm gathering many of you would probably have been raised in some sort of tradition or been part of some sort of tradition along the way, but a couple of people not. And so it's just, I think in either sense, it's a struggle to find spirituality sometimes. Whether there's a tradition that, you know, sort of stands in your way or the sense of not knowing where to go that stands in your way. I could talk about me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, w when I was a child, my parents were not very, we were Jewish and my parents were not very um, observant. You know, they didn't go to temple every Sabbath. Um, but, you know, there were four main holidays that we observed, uh, one of which I think my, I think it just ended. Rosh Hashanah uh, was mm -hmm. Jewish New Year, um, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, and uh, Passover. And um, and they sent me to a school that was nearby so that I could be bar mitzvahed. So from page, uh, from age nine to 13, um, after school, uh, maybe about three, three, four days a week, uh, I would go to Hebrew school and, uh, and I would learn whatever it was about the religion. And my parents didn't believe that because it was an Orthodox school and they were very, you know, I guess closer to the fundamentalist side of a religion. And, um, and, uh, and uh, I remember I, I had this great voice, like my my 13 year old voice hadn't cracked yet and I could hit the high notes like Michael Jackson. And they wanted me to come and sing at, you know, at the, the, the services every Saturday. And my parents just said, you know, absolutely not. So, uh, <laughs> so that was the end of that. And I became an atheist when I went to college but i was a benevolent atheist i didn't have any animosity or criticize anybody else's religion um maybe i might have had thoughts that were critical but uh, and i would never you know out loud and then um then i started exploring spirituality i read um a book about taoism and i read a book of and then i went to a, a buddhist a meditation center and learned how to meditate. So now I just call myself a Jubu because I still, you know, uh, observe the four holidays. But when I go for Yom Kippur services, I do it in a Buddhist meditation center. And so it's all the Jewish Buddhists <laughs> get together and, you know, and they take, take what they want, you know, and we meditate, we meditate, uh, as part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Welcome to America, huh? <laughs> we are, we are in that way. We are a melting pot, you know. So many ways in which we really aren't. Well, we like to think that, but there's so much of that um, picking and choosing among religious traditions and spiritual practices that we, we do, we just do. And some people like, I think that's wonderful. And there'll be people that tell you that you know, that's wrong because you're not honoring the, the purity of whatever tradition it is. But I don't know that we can be any other way given what we know. And that's why this is spirituality for grownups. I mean, we do know things at this stage of life. You can't just tell us that we have to believe something and we're going to believe it. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't pass on anything 
really that I have not experienced myself. So it, for me, faith is not a set of um, creeds or you must believe this. For me, faith is a trust that I have been blessed with in the life process. But something is going on that I can't always just, I can't always put a label on, I can't always rationally explain, but I know it's there. And it's made itself known to me so many times that I just have to, that's the faith that there's more going on, the more with the capital M, there's more going on than I can ever um, know at any given moment. And it's yeah. benevolent. It's benevolent, basically. It's been it's it's growth producing. It's hard sometimes, but it is growth producing, and it's um, it's 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 kind, and loving. And in my book that I wrote, I wrote a book called um, "Out of Your Mind and Into Your Heart." Um, we don't say God is loving necessarily. We say God is love. It they're like equal. <laughs> like equal sign god equals love so it's like it's like to to love is to participate in god if you want to use the word god and is is there are there challenges that people have throughout their lives developing their spirituality um how do people plateau or get stuck in their spiritual development, you know, what are what are the causes? How do they get unstuck if they get stuck? I think I've <laughs> plateaued so at, at times for sure. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it's anybody. Has anyone? Are, we, are we resonating? Anybody? <laughs> Feel free to jump in. Have you been stuck? You can raise your hand, you can shake your, have you been stuck sometimes? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's Absolutely. I see John there, yeah. Have you been stuck? Do you wanna talk about that at all? I think uh, early on, you know, I relate to you, Marie, I'm a Presbyterian minister. Ah, although I, I never had a parish. <clears throat> um, and I'm also a Buddhist. Um, I, um, the whole understanding of double belonging or being both Jewish and Buddhist or uh, sort of one of the traditional main, mainstream religions in, in our country, uh, plus the mystical traditions drawing on the East for that um, has been a, a, my path, really, out of necessity. I think early on, uh, losing family, um, when, when some people in my family died, um, I, that always became a kind of core question. You know, what is this life? And uh, so here I am, I just had, uh, in June, my uh, 80th birthday. And uh, I'm still asking the same question. It's still motivating me. But I also have uh, found that it's possible to continue. You know, the path is not, uh, I would say, it doesn't plateau in a sense. It only uh, allows us to go deeper. Um, and I think the title of your book, which I haven't read, but I'm interested in, Moving into the Heart, uh, Eastern traditions talk about heart-mind, or in Buddhism, we say bodhicitta, the awakened heart-mind, you know, that it's beyond the concepts, beyond the stories, beyond the narratives that we've grown up with that have been meaningful in our, in our mainstream religions, you know, the stories the historicity of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. But underneath that is, is another dimension. And, and I like your uh, describing it as, the, as more going deeper, the heart dimension that is um, without uh, limits, without a beginning and end, without boundaries um, is 
where, where I think we're headed, you know, a depth dimension rather than a conceptual linear uh, space time dimension. Yes. Yes. My feeling. We, at wow. This so you've been on some journey. Well, it's just our life. You know, once I asked Brother David Steindlerass, uh, what oh, is yeah. spirituality? And he said, spirituality is just to be alive and fully alive. Mm. Said, mm. Yes. What, what is that fullness? <laughs> I know we're still trying. Yeah. <laughs> It seems so simple, doesn't it? Everybody's laughing. It seems so simple, but it is, it's is—it's—it's difficult. And that could, but then we come to that plateau thing that, that, that Jeff was talking about, that, you know, what stands in our way is, is, is sometimes us, you know? Um, a lot of times it's us, because that's us is what keeps us in the systems that might, that might stifle us, but we're afraid to move out from that because it's comfortable. It, it's, it's our belonging. It's, um, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to live the spiritual life authentically, is it? Because, because we have to be pioneers sometimes. Mm -hmm. We have to say we are this and that, or I was this and now I'm that, or I'm not sure I'm anything right now, or, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Simple, but not easy. That's another thing I like to say. It can be very simple, but not easy. I think people also, um, you know, when you are of a certain age, you want people to respect you as an elder. And uh, I, I've been through situations where I already know all this stuff. I know it all. You know, it's like, I've been there, done that. And yet sometimes I'll say, there's so much that I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know everything. There's always something new to learn, no matter how old uh, you become. And so I wonder, uh, are there ways we can expand our own spirituality? in this stage of life. Why rest on our laurels kind of thing? Oh, I think Priscilla yeah, wants to Priscilla, say. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the way um, I experience it, um, having been, I was brought up in a very um, dogmatic Christian um, environment, which I dumped as a teenager <laughs> and became a raging atheist for a while. And then, but the older I get, the more I feel that spirituality is about um, feeling connected to all of life and to life that has gone before and to others, you know, the, the larger community of, of people, but also plants and animals and, and life on earth that to feel not diminished, but to feel a small part of it. And that feeling to me increases as I get older and I'm, I'm 79, so um, almost 80. Um, and so um, I've just experienced that more and more going down the street and like being aware of the trees and the flowers and the other people. And so that's mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. And of course that leads us to the, hi there, Debbie. <laughs> that leads us to the big, <laughs> the big questions, of course, that we can't answer. But the question that's around mortality, which you don't feel at a certain point, because even though you might give lip service to it, there comes a point where it's just it just becomes right in your face. And that and that brings spirituality to another level, also, I think, you know, to feel part of something and connected, to wonder what that means in the long run, or where there is no time and space, what's it's gonna be. Um, and we can't, the language doesn't even make any sense, but, but I think we're pushed unless we're young and have had a real, um, and there are people that have had real health issues very young, but unless you've had that, it really takes getting older to, to be pushed. And, and, and that can expand you once you can give into that. Um, that we were talking today uh, and Louise was part of a discussion. We were talking about vulnerability. 
once you can give in to that vulnerability to a certain degree, um, you can expand in ways that you didn't think possible before. Because there's something about being younger and building your life that demands a protectiveness. It demands a, a constant attention to the outside world. Whereas when you get older, you have more, hopefully, although I know a lot of older people who are trying to keep themselves busy, busy, busy all the time, but hopefully you have some time to go in and, and then to be vulnerable to your loved ones or friends to kind of say, I don't know. And, and Jeff was saying, well, you know, I think I know. I, I, and I think I do too. And then I realize I don't know anything. And, and that, that's really an opening. So, and, and meditation, as he was talking about too, is the way you can sit maybe and, and drop or at least pay attention to the ways in which your brain tries to channel life for you. Just watch it happening. It's not about quieting. I teach some meditation. It's not about pushing thoughts out. It's not about not having any thoughts. It's about being willing to be a witness to your thinking process and realizing what you do as a matter of course, and then being willing to step away from that whenever you realize you're doing that in your everyday life, like labeling things and judging things. Hmm. So with meditation, uh, does learning meditation as an older adult and a beginner work? Can, 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 can people so. 50, 60 plus uh, do it? Is it too late? Is it ever too late? <laughs> Could it be too late? To learn how to meditate? <laughs> you're never too late to meditate. Um, in fact, you're probably at a really good place if you haven't done it before, or if you have done it and dropped it. Probably good because, because we have so many um, assumptions that we make and that are put on us. And... And to be able to sit and just um, breathe and, and, and notice what's going on in that silly brain of ours is so freeing because then you don't have to take any of it seriously unless you choose to. Like, like you can pick and choose your thoughts at that point instead of buying into the thoughts that just seem to want to take over. So no, the only, the only problem with getting older is people might be stuck in their ways. And we know, I always say, just because you get older, you don't get wiser necessarily. I know a lot of old, stupid people. Okay. <laughs> you probably do too. But we don't want to be old and stupid. We want to be old and wise. And that demands a, a vulnerability, a letting go, uh, a, lot, a witnessing to our own thought process, um, awe, being, being awed by things. John, you look like you're thinking heavily there. Uh, no, I'm listening heavily. <laughs> I think meditation comes in a lot of shapes and forms. For instance, um, I'm an artist and I spent the afternoon working on a project and the time flew because I was so engrossed in what I was doing and that that's like my special time. It's my checkout time. It's my creative time. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I experienced something really extraordinary today. I live in Cape May, New Jersey, um, near the beach, and the monarch butterflies are coming through right now. And so I rushed down to the spot where all the people were congregating, and there tonight there's a roost. And so there's all of these butterflies come huddled together in the trees just waiting for the wind to change to be able to take the leap over to Delaware to continue south and there were so many people there just appreciating this phenomenon of nature that only happens once a year here and it's special because you feel a connectedness to the other people that are there appreciating that and you feel like the journey that these little teeny tiny creatures are on. And it makes you, it kind of puts you in your place in a way, <laughs> is how I look at it. Um, yes. They're traveling yes. 
thousands of miles just because that's what they do and appreciate like taking the time to appreciate those things is kind of what spirituality means for me like my husband will say you need to meditate Carla and I'll say what do you think I'm doing when I go to the beach for an hour and I listen to the ocean now he says Carla you need to go to the beach and listen to the ocean because it's <laughs> my meditation time so it takes a lot of shapes and forms. It's, it doesn't yes. necessarily need to have the label of religion. No. In fact, meditation is not religion. It is not. Um, it's spiritual practice. And as Carl is saying, it comes in many forms. As long as you are allowing yourself to sort of um, be part of something bigger, uh, witness your process, um, uh, but the meditation practice sitting is just like one way of getting ourselves ready for these other moments of awe. I think that might be part of it. Do you? Like when I would teach yoga, I would say, you know, I'll, te I'll let's go through this little sequence we do, but I'm really not that interested in what you do on the mat. I'm really interested that you take this out with you into the world because what you do on your mat, you're probably doing out there. So that's spiritual practice and every religion has spiritual practices. So if your religion, if you are practicing something and it's their practices are helping you to be in touch with the more, then keep doing that, that, that religion. But if it's not, just know that there are similar practices in other places that you can also connect with. I'm really curious where Carla is that she's seeing all the butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> that fascinates me. I would love to see that. So I live in Cape May, New Jersey. Cape May. And I've heard reports of people come from, coming from long distances right now because they've seen um, Facebook posts about the butterflies roosting. So they're here. I can't promise that they're going to be here in a week, but they're here right now. They're, they're everywhere. It's beautiful. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Mm. Who else? Anybody else who hasn't spoken who would like to speak? Yeah, I, uh, this is Lakshmi. I am a, uh, by religion, I practice Hinduism. And mm -hmm. I, I come from a religious family back in India. I came to this country. 35, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I admit, I'm not as religious as my parents. My mother does live with me. Um, and Hinduism is one religion. It's not dogmatic. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's said that it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, you must have heard Hinduism has like millions of gods. There is a reason for it. Because you can tailor Hinduism to your liking, to your way of life. Mm -hmm. And meditation is just an offshoot of Hinduism. Our old rishis, the saints uh, that wrote the scriptures way before any religion in the world, um, they, had they have literally writ written all these in the scriptures. And meditation is, and yoga, is nothing but an extension of uh, uh, accepting that there is someone bigger than yourself. You see, when you take a life of a human, and for the most part, humans are the only ones that can discern, that can think for themselves, that can think beyond their realm and say, who am I? Where did I come from? and realize that there is a higher being somewhere controlling this whole universe. We are a mere speck in this universe, right from a microbe. You can see the enormity of the universe from a microbe like an amoeba to huge galaxies, the size changes and who controls all this? There's some power out there that controls it that's, that's invisible and every religion tries to reach it, but then it's, it's, and every religion has its own way of acknowledging that. So yes, what it, we, I come from a, a, there are many sects in Hinduism. I come from a sect where 
they say, you know, you have to have a teacher in your life without being initiated to things like yoga, meditation, prayers. Uh, yes, there are books, but there is a reason people go to college and school because you, you, you have to learn from a teacher, a learned one. And in old Hinduism, it used to be taught by word of mouth. Um, it, it, it's called Gurukula, where you literally go and live with your guru in, in the guru's house. You serve the guru, you cook for him, you wash his clothes, you literally learn. And then the guru in turn teaches you the way of life. That, uh, let's let's just take that nugget there and um yes there is truth in that i do want to say of course there is but that is the thing about religion religion has these understandings and then some people will find that very helpful and other people will not find that helpful and what i'm here to say is there is spirituality and you can find a practice that is for you and it might not be like that it might not be like the one you grew up in it might be but it doesn't have to be because because it's always deeper and always more than what we think. Um, so that's all I want to say about that is that everybody here could probably give us a nugget of what their tradition told them was the way to go. And they may they may think that's wonderful and continue with that. But somebody else may say, no, that is not for me. And I'm here to say that's either way is OK. You can Correct. take it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's okay to. Sh in our society, we we do we do shop around. You know, we do pick and choose. And some people say that's a terrible thing, but I think that's the only thing we can do here is 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 kind of take something from one, take something from another. Although there is something very beautiful in picking a tradition and staying with it at least for a while, because because it is true that there is a depth in going deep into uh, one of the traditions, one of the faiths. And you can reject it later if you choose to, but there is something beautiful, wouldn't you say in that? Um, because because it's easy to flip around and that's where Americans get a bad name sometime. Um, you know, so so going deep is good to study something or practice something for a while and, 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 and belong with that. And then you can always let it go if it's not for you. So, so <laughs> Jeff, what, what, where, where were we? What, what else did you want to delve into, if anything? Because I can go off, you know, my, my friends know yeah. I can keep going. Yeah, we can let you go extempore, uh, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, um, uh, can, can, can atheists or conversely, uh, religious people turn to the spiritual and I would think that if if people are really religious then they're pretty much uh, grounded in that way of life and so those people would consider their religions their spirituality as well but uh, what about atheists who don't believe in the more uh I mean, I eventually came around, but. <laughs> yeah. Dogma, dogma in any form kind of is a is kind of like negating the possibilities. So, so whether it's fundamentalist dogma or whether it's atheistic dogma, it does kind of tend to take away the possibility. Agnosticism is great. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I said in my book, I wrote there's three sentences with the begin with the word I that I use a lot more as I get older. And one is I love you. And one is um, I don't know. And the other is, isn't that interesting? Some of my people will, will know that. Isn't that interesting? So somebody does something like, like boggles my mind. Isn't that interesting? So and I don't know. So agnosticism is wonderful. In fact, I think most traditions could use a little agnosticism. Because if you're in the in the dogma of some faith or other, you realize that they are going to tell you this is the way it is, and it can't be any different. And and that's as that, that's a that that's as bad as the person who looks at you and says, "Well, you're crazy. There can't be anything else except the physical." So so any kind of dogma that shuts off possibility is something to be wary of, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I met um, someone who had joined a Buddhist sect where they said um, chanting, an our way of chanting is the right way to do it. And whatever, uh, like, I, I just kept it to myself, but I thought, well, wouldn't you who are telling me this, wouldn't that like set off a little red flag for you? Um, I don't think anyone has the right way personally. Yes, I met a bunch of Buddhists one a, a long time ago when I was meditating in a circle and they said the same thing. They had a long discussion after we had a half hour meditation of whether anybody could actually really achieve enlightenment who didn't meditate the way they did. And I thought, oh my God, the Buddhists are as bad as the Christians. Oh my gosh. And then, and then, and then I went to Copenhagen with a friend who's Danish. And we I met, this was years ago. So I met a, a guy who'd actually studied with Carl Jung. He was an older man analyst, and he studied with Carl Jung. And he I didn't tell him anything about me, what I studied, what I was, he didn't know anything about me. But he made the statement. Just like I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is as bad as anything I've ever heard. You cannot be fully um, realized and a true self unless you have a complete Jungian analysis, which encompasses how many days a week for how many years. This was just a blanket statement that this Jungian analyst threw out there. And I thought to myself, he knows nothing about what I know. And I've heard this statement so many times from so many different traditions that I've learned not to believe it at all. You see? But everyone, whether it's a Buddhist, whether it's a Jungian analyst, whether it's a Presbyterian minister, everybody's a Roman Catholic priest. They all have their idea of what it is, has to be. And then a, an atheist would probably have the same thing on the other end. It's like, well, this is the way it is and you can't look for anything else. But why do you think that is? Why because do you think that is? Because why, are they, why are they all saying that? Because we like to be right. It makes us feel safe. I mean, if if I'm on the right, right? You, you know what I'm saying, Carla. Like, if I'm right, if I'm on the right path, you must be on the wrong path. That's, that's what a lot of people who who don't get it think. It, it's also the ego and the, and yes. the humility, humility. Yeah, it is that the, the other ego. person may be right. So it's it, the human element that gets involved that complicates things absolutely spirituality is about controlling your ego yes the ego and um, i me my the ego's control. job is to keep us alive and on the planet for as long as it takes and it's doing a great job and i never tell my meditation students not to have an ego i never say drop the ego have a beautiful strong ego but let it be porous let it be flexible, let it be expanded <laughs> um, and know its limitations because it's here to protect you. And sometimes to be in spirit is to let that protection go for a while. And to be caught by something else. So yes. it's a form of vulnerability? Mm -hmm. I think. We're saying, I don't know. We're saying, I this works for me. And I love that when someone says, you know, I belong to this group and it works for me. That's lovely. And I invite you to come along if you'd like to see what this is about. That's fine. Not, I belong to this group and it's the only way to go and you need to come because if you're not, you're going to go to hell or you're going to not be saved or <laughs> that's not spirituality. That, that, then it's getting into the organization of religion which by its nature has to have parameters. The organizations to survive have to have parameters. But your job as you get older, I think, is to um, transcend those. Okay. Um, your mission if you choose to accept it. Oh, good, Jane. Jane. Okay. You can hear me now, right? Okay. Yes. Um, I, like you, uh, was uh, raised Catholic and am a retired Presbyterian minister. And I can't believe there's three of them right here. That's incredible. 
But anyway, wow. <laughs> um, my, but what I struggle with is, I guess, uh, since God is that people don't want to talk about God. And I say, well, I do. I love God. I love to talk about God. But it's not meaning that I want to, you know, give people certain rules. It's just that I have been raised and grown and preached about God all my life. And now somebody says, if you say God to somebody who's trying to get their spirituality in check, they like look at you, and this is they, but I have to say my, my very best friend is all into the spirituality. And if I mention the word God, and she had the same background as me, it's like it blows her mind. She can't, you know, and I'm having trouble with my friend. I don't want to talk about anything spiritual or religious with my friend, which I think is um, sad, sad. You know, she, like she says, Jane, there is no God and there are no rules. I said, okay. Oh, that's, that's harsh. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but, but I don't have issues with meditation or yoga or going deeper or knowing that I don't know everything about um, our uh, immortality or what, whatever comes after that little break. I don't know everything about that. Um, I know what has been taught by Christianity and I treasure that. And it does say there's more, so that's good. There's, so I don't want to throw everything out. And I, I don't have to do that, of course. I don't, but I feel that sometimes I'm just, I can still say God or Jesus and still have a spiritual life. And I don't, so that's, but I do realize that I have thrown out all the rules and regulations and all of that all my life. So that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about worship for one thing. Worship. Um, that to me is very precious. Very precious. Um, and, you know, whatever rules or regulations go along with that, eh, you know, I don't particularly dive into that. But worship is beautiful to me. So there is no God and there are no rules. I guess there is, there is no worship. There's um, self, uh, you know, getting in touch with yourself and going along with people and having compassion and all of that. But I, I think I would be missing um, my Christian life and values if I wasn't able to realize that that's still a big, huge part of me. It's never going to go anywhere. That's beautiful, Jane. I mean, you're, you're, nobody's saying you need to give that up. Right. No. And if, if and when, whatever happens when we die, it is what it is. I'm not going to. I'm not going to make any big, you know, uh, presentations about it. But there is hope. So that comes out of Christianity. There is hope. There is hope about going beyond this life. There's, we know that somehow we feel it, that there's more to who we are and what, why we're here and how we got here. And we don't all know that. So we can't know it now. So let's say we're going to know some more about it on and on and on and on and on. But I don't okay. want to call God the universe. You don't have to. Yeah, so that's, that's that. what... No, Maybe you do things. not have to. Yeah. The thing is, we we each have a, a an understanding of our path, and we're each going to live it in our way. And your way is perfectly valid. And I know you're saying also that someone else's way is can also be valid. So what your friend is doing is make is sort of invalidating your set, and that is not so good. Um, so nobody's saying that's right, the right thing to do. You know, we don't invalidate each other's path. Yeah. 
Oh, I love her still and she'll always be my best. I'm friend. sure. But oh, once in a while that goes moing. <laughs> yes, I understand. We don't give each other the grace of, of hearing um, each other's stories and allowing that to be different sometimes from our own story. Mm -hmm. and, and if we could do that, I mean, how do we expect the, the countries to get together or the parties and the political parties to, to get together if we can't even yeah. listen to each other and, and validate each other and mm -hmm. be different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I, that's why I came here tonight to um, get this uh, sort of off my chest and try to uh, work it out a little more. So good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think we could agree with that, right? We have, I know some of the people here and I don't know others. I just got to know you this tonight, but I can tell there's a variety of experiences and, mm -hmm. and that is the good thing. Spirit, and there is a spirituality in Christianity. There's a spirituality in Judaism. There's a spirituality yeah. in Islam. There's a spirituality in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And our job is to sort of um, either pick a path or sort of um, process the path we've been on mm -hmm. and, and, and make sure that we are um, validating the spirituality of it. Right. That's really what's important. Right. And since I've worked in the institutions, both Catholic and, and Protestant um, and others, um, I kind of know there are people who can do that and they work to do that. And there's people that are stuck. They're just, they see it as one thing and you have to be in that one thing to be valid. Right. Okay. That's the problem. And there's a both end that we're uh, let, let, we could meet in the middle, but that doesn't. Yeah, so just not, we, we may never meet in the middle, but you know mm -hmm. what? I always say God, God is really not in the, in the details. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Debbie, what do you want to say? Yeah. That's true. So, so this is going to be really different from everybody else, but you know what that's what the world is about mm -hmm. i don't work at spirituality i don't struggle with it i'm just open to where i am and what happens and and i mean there are many times like you're talking about meditation i was into drumming for a long time and oh my goodness that can really be meditative yes. we, we had this uh wonderful drum well it was we called a drum circle it was mostly a women's circle and we really supported each other. And we had our own little ceremonies, like a croning ceremony when somebody got older and I did, you know, all sorts of to, to really support each other and, and recognize each other. And, and, you know, it was beautiful. And then, and then within that, we did some drumming, we did things with oh, bowls and, you know, all sorts of sweet sounded things, you know, um, I'm thinking nature based. If I'm out in nature, I mean, that really connects me with something, you know, if it's, yeah, so that's a big one. Um, then I found the uh, Unitarians. Now, this was a long time ago. So I grew up, my family knows that it's Jewish by background, but never practiced at all. And so, you know, I really had no religious, but, you know, upbringing at all. But I found the Unitarians when I was early 20s. And I love it. And I'm still doing it. And it's like, so it, that's all about supporting each other in the now, doing whatever you can to make the world a better place, to make each other, you know, to recognize people around you. But you can have whatever beliefs you want. So that's really, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I enjoy every time I go, I learn something. It's a mind expanding every time you go. It's I, something new to think about. I'm, I'm trying to think of all the things I was thinking while you were talking. Um, of chanting. Chanting is very meditative and just singing in the choir. Oh my goodness, that's just so wonderful. When you have all these voices around you and all these harmonies and it just takes you somewhere else. So I'm just open to what happens around me and appreciative when there's something that takes me somewhere else rather than just where I am. Yeah, Debbie is really, I mean, uh, Debbie and I do ukulele together, so we do music. <laughs> and that music is, 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 is definitely spiritual. But we didn't even talk about this when I talked about my book, uh, The Heart, Getting Into the Heart. Energy is usually a big piece of what I talk about. I just didn't get to that yet. If you ever want to, if you want to do another, another, another talk, we can certainly do it. But energy, the God is the primal loving energy is how I would describe God for me. And so to be in that energy, 
you might have a definition for that and you might not. And, and the, the, the loving energy just loves us. So, so it doesn't really care, he, she, it, it does not really care. I don't think that we have the right definition. I think it's what, what Debbie's saying is we enter the energy and that's what Carla said with the butterflies. You know, whatever puts you in, if worship puts you in that energy, great. Other people will go to worship service and go, this, this does nothing for me. Um, and, and that's okay. It's whatever puts you in the loving energy is what's bringing you closer to God or the divine. That's, that's, my, that's my experience. But we could, we could talk all day about energy modalities, about, about, about healing energy, because uh, uh, we're not, we just said this today, uh, uh, Louise and, and I did, about the energy that supports us. We're not alone. We feel uh, alone. But, but all spirituality say that is, that's a, um, um, a fallacy that we carry with us, that we're separate and alone. We are connected. And anything that helps us to see that connection is of divine origin and is spiritual. Wow. Well, I think that last sentence tied it up in a pretty bow as we come up on uh, eight o'clock. Unless there's something else that you want to add that might tie up tonight's uh, session. <laughs> I, can, I can just give you my, my email in case you, want, in case you sure. want my email. And believe me, I'm not trying to sell my book, but um, <laughs> if you want a book, I can, I can, I can give that to you. Um, but my, my email is heart, H-E-A-R-T, 239. That's the one I use. I use a couple of them. But 239 at Hotmail, my old one, um, dot com. So if you, if you wanted to be in touch, you certainly could be. Um, um, or I can be in touch with Jeff and we can see if we want to do any more stuff like this. Um, but I want to thank you all for sharing so nicely. Um, and just jumping in because it makes it so much easier to talk about this when when people share where they're coming from and uh we are in good energy i trust that each one here is in good energy <laughs> hey carl <laughs> bye <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks so, nice so much marie music. this was this thank was you, great Dale. and thank you all for participating thank you yes. see you all thank you thank, thank you for you. finding me Thank all you. right, guys. Thank you for organizing Thank it. You. Thank you. Some of you all see around. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.